Guys, I just woke up and I had the funniest dream. It was one of those dreams where you like think it's real, but then you think about it and you're like, no, it wasn't real. That didn't happen. But I had a dream where I did some kind of sport. Maybe it was like basketball. Maybe it was jujitsu. I don't know. And then afterwards I went out with some people and we went to get food and I got a burger and some fries. And then I forgot that I was doing paleo. And so I ate like a few bites and then I remembered I was doing paleo. And I was like, oh, wait, fries are paleo. And then I was like, no, they're not. <laughs> and then I was kind of just like, F it. I'm just going to eat this whole entire meal. <laughs> so then I ate this whole entire meal. And then I felt so guilty because I was going to have to <laughs> lie to all the followers. Or, like, tell them that I cheated in this, in this diet. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. <laughs> Welcome back to our channel, Nutrition Unpacked. Today, we are going over our first week on the paleo diet and how that went. Initial thoughts? I what word comes to mind? Sad. Sadness. Yeah. Sucky. <laughs> horrible. Yeah, horrible. Lots of words. <laughs> we'll get into it. We have now done one whole week on the paleo diet. And that is no small feat at all. This week has felt like an eternity. It has been hard. You know, the whole point of this diet, it's supposed to be how our ancestors ate way back when. And I've asked myself, is this actually how, you know, the first humans ate? As we talked about in our last video, the entire rationale is that, you know, pre-agricultural revolution, pre-farming, pre like dairy farming, plant farming, all of those things, we ate in a very specific way and our bodies have supposedly evolved to that particular environment and those types of foods and supposedly mimicking that in some way is optimal for our health and well-being. So that's where all the recommendations for, you know, choosing meats and fish and eggs and vegetables and fruits, some nuts and seeds, kind of avoiding dairy and legumes and grains, avoiding processed foods, added sugars, all of those things. That's where all of those recommendations are coming. From. It's interesting to see how Dr. Cordain like writes about this on the website and kind of where he got his inspiration from. There was a paper that was published in the 80s, I think it was 1985, and um, it was all about the Paleolithic diet and what that was supposed to have looked like. And apparently Dr. Cordain had read it at the time and this was what sparked his passion for the Paleolithic diet and kind of sparked this idea for him to write this book and to popularize this idea of the Paleolithic diet. What's kind of interesting though is looking at that pa paper, what they define as the Paleolithic era is like a really long period of time. It's like from 250,000 years ago to like about between 10 and 20,000 years ago. And I'm like- 2.5 million years That's right. Hey, did I you said 250,000 right? and then you said 250 million. <laughs> We're having a hard one. It's the, it's, the, it's the paleo brain. It's the paleo brain. Can I tell you actually? I have never had this happen. I was trying, it's so ironic. I was trying to say like in some ways I feel more alert than ever, mm -hmm. but in some ways I also feel, I, I don't know, I was like, but also more hungry than ever. It's, it's like a weird juxtaposition. And it took me like 18 mm -hmm. tries to finish that sentence because I kept getting distracted. Oh. Like I would start the sentence and I'd be like, ooh, this sweater. It's like, ooh, this mug, ooh, this it's slate. Paleo onset ADHD. <laughs> So weird. That is so funny. Oh my goodness. No, oh. I've just been like an emotional wreck. Yeah, it's quite a wide range that they cover. Like everything from two and a half million years ago all the way to 10,000 years ago. Kind of looking at what that type of diet looks like. That's what the Paleolithic era is. Which is interesting as well, because 2.5 million years ago, like, yes, we were in like the same, what is it, kingdom, phylum, class, genus, family. Families. So we're in the same family yeah. as we are now, but humans as we know them, like Homo sapiens sapiens, which is what we are, we're not around. This is like Homo erectus at Australopithecus. I don't know what that is in English. I took, I took Australopithecus. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> like this is one of the first humanoid species, but that was not humans. So to be like, this is what they ate, therefore that's what we eat. It's like me being like, oh, this is what baboons eat. Mm. And we have a shared ancestor and that's what we should eat. But anyway, to be fair to Dr. Cordain's credit, he does acknowledge that, you know, we don't necessarily know exactly what people were eating way back then. But his perspective is that at least the paleo diet as we know it today, as he promotes it today, 
can be considered a template for what was being eaten back then. So then the question is, well, even if we were to kind of maybe loosen up our analytic lens a little bit, does it still make sense? Do we still think that, you know, avoiding things like grains, legumes, added salt, all of those things, is that still in alignment with the general template of how things were being eaten back then? As you can imagine, you know, you, people all around the world weren't eating a single type of diet. The types of foods that people were eating varied a lot depending on the physical location, the type of regional climate, and then the season as well. That being said, it is kind of thought that there may be a couple of biases in the inherent in the data when people are looking at archaeological evidence or ethnographic data from that time period. It seems like the data might be skewed to some of the northern regions, and the reason for that is as you can imagine, a lot of farming practices may have initiated or started in the warmer climates, meaning that maybe some of the older school way of gathering food got pushed out of those regions earlier in our history, meaning that we might not have as much of that kind of those records to look at now in those regions. And as we know, in northern regions, there are there is higher meat consumption. So that might be kind of skewing our perception of what food intake as a whole looked like back then. Additionally, anytime you're looking at something archaeological, we're trying to fill in the blanks and I'm not a nutritional anthropologist by any means, so I don't know, but anytime you're trying to fill in blanks, your own personal biases are at play. And another possible bias that might just come out from the archaeological evidence is just the t nature of the tools or whatever that we have found. So for example, tools that are made from like bone or stone, which are kind of associated with hunting, hunting tools, that those types of things are inherently better preserved than maybe tools that were made with like wood or other types of plants. So that might also be kind of skewing our perception of the main types of foods that were being eaten back then. That being said, scientists have been able to kind of get a maybe a more concrete sense of what might have been happening by then by combining that archaeological evidence with also studying modern day tribes, modern day groups of people that still live in that similar lifestyle. So one of the most commonly studied groups of people is the Hadza group in Tanzania and this is really interesting because you know as you know Africa is kind of considered like the birthplace of human evolution so it seems like a pretty good region to study to get a sense of maybe what was happening back then and when they look at this particular population along with kind of archaeological evidence it seems like they're for sure eating animals so especially like small game animals fish maybe shellfish and small fish insects and their products, a lot of honey apparently, especially in that region, but also a lot of plant foods that include tubers, nuts, seeds, even barley that's been used as flour and legumes as well. And I think that's really interesting to note because we have Dr. Cordain who's out here so against anyone eating legumes, so against people eating too many sweeteners, so against any kind of grain products. And I think we have to keep in mind that especially when we didn't have such abundance of food and didn't have like agriculture where we were having such big productions of food we couldn't really be that picky about things beggars can't be choosers exactly. if you eat what you find exactly and one of the things that dr Cordain talks about on his website is like he uses lactase persistence which is like the the fact that many people are uh lactose intolerant in adulthood as like evidence that like, we're not adapted to have dairy mm -hmm. and i'm like that's interesting, especially when we see that many cultures who do use dairy, even if they're more using more traditional methods, actually ferment out the sugar. So, you know, it's hard to say that, like, because we just don't have this mm -hmm. one enzyme, therefore we're not adapted to eat dairy ever and it's bad for you. It's kind of like kind of leap in mm -hmm. some of the mm -hmm. logic there. Yeah. I mean, to his credit, I think when we look at what early people may have eaten there, I think there is a a lot of overlap with what he's proposing in his paleo diet principles but there's definitely i think it's not a perfect template as he likes to view it as i will also say he is very confident in his knowledge which love that for him for sure but like some of the phrases he uses this is like he's like the mm -hmm. foremost leader in what like our ancestors ate and like no one knows as much as him and the guys who wrote that paper He's like, yeah, he paid me the biggest compliment that I knew more than he did on this topic. And it's just, it's really interesting the way he writes about this stuff. Um, so love the confidence, but I'm sure there's probably like a whole group of anthropologists and archaeologists who are like, oh, that's interesting because 
I don't know about that. <laughs> and that being said, I mean, anthropology and archaeology aren't our area of expertise either. Mm -hmm. uh, but based on the papers and the research that we did, it does seem like decent overlap, but probably not. I don't think the all the rules necessarily line up with how early people probably ate. Temporality and location are big factors in what early people ate. And when Dr. Cordain is talking about this, he's kind of painting it all with this large brush saying everyone on the planet ate this. And I can even think of like, you know, when we talk about like Inuit diets, mm -hmm. those are very different from what Dr. Cordain is talking about. If we look at like people who lived in, you know, um, the Hadza tribe or people who are living in Nordic countries, it's all very, very different. He has a huge focus on maybe the types of foods, but then there's also the question of absolute amounts of the f different types of foods and also the relative proportions of the different types of foods. So. I think, I mean, I think he does acknowledge that there's no way to mimic the foods exactly. And especially apparently like, I don't know, have you seen those images of like what original bananas actually look yeah. like? And what <laughs> I mean, I, I've in fact checked those images. I don't know where, how, where, where it came from, mm -hmm. but it's weird. Yeah, I've seen those. And corn. Corn, yeah, it's like this like tiny little thing. And yeah. now like, these are huge, bright corn. yellow things. But you know, he doesn't really address that in his diet, really. He just yeah. kind of has his foods not to eat and then his foods to eat. But, you know, he does address the fact that, you know, we have very different food sources than we did at that time, but it's not really like, oh, well, this has been changed so much, you shouldn't eat it, kind right. of thing. It's, it's weird. The things that he focuses on are strange. And, um, you know, like there is a lot of science behind it in some ways, but in other ways, it's kind of just like, I don't like potatoes, so you can't eat potatoes. The saponins, Layla. The, the saponins. So tell me a little bit about your first week. What were the highs? What are the lows? What did you like? What did you not like? I think we could take a step back and even start with the day before day one. Yes. Is that paleo approved? No. Calcium carbonate and canola oil, which I don't think you even have. And they're peas. I shouldn't even make this up. Should we look maybe the Earth's Own brand? That looks natural. <laughs> so I guess marketing really works on you. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's, what kind is this? Almond? This is oh, oh no, we definitely can't have that one. I realized is that there's a lot of keto stuff. There's a lot of keto stuff on the market, but definitely not as much paleo. Most definitely not paleo. Those damn anti-nutrients <laughs> get you every time. <laughs> We found something paleo. paleo. What's in it? Wait, the flavor is salt and apple cider vinegar. Is that what we want? Is that the flavor we're going for? So is part of the rules, if something says that it's paleo, we can eat it? Well, this is paleo certified. Oh, okay. But I imagine if it's salty, then it's not paleo. Oh, but it's Himalayan salt. Yeah. Ah, if the salt is pink, it's fine. Okay. That one doesn't say paleo on it though. Yeah, it does. Does it? It's certified Oh, paleo. amazing. And six grams of protein. Oh, what's in What that? is it? Organic cassava flour, cage free. Oh, dried egg whites. You want one? I'm gonna try a different flavor. Let's get the original. Let's get the the Himalayan pink salt. What's in it? You know what? Then I'm looking for some protein. I'm gonna go for the power curls in this flavor. Then <sighs> does this have egg in it? Yeah, non-GMO egg whites. 10 grams of protein for 35 pieces, which is about half of the bag. But hey, that's pretty good. I'm happy. Woo! Cheers. Cheers. Full disclosure, like I have never actually done a diet before. Like I've never gone on a diet before, like for health reasons, weight change. Like I've never intentionally had a date where I'm going to start a diet. That's not an experience I have. And I know for a lot of people, that is a common experience to start a diet. A very common experience is this idea of like, the last supper mentality, mm -hmm. you know, we learn about it. The idea like, oh, starting New Year's, Monday, next week, tomorrow, I'm not gonna be able to eat X, Y, and Z. Therefore, I better get it all in now. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced that, but last Sunday, those thoughts were creeping up into my head. And even my husband was like, oh my God, we're not gonna get, be able to get pizza. Like we should go get pizza today. And there's a part of me, like, and I wasn't even in the mood for pizza, but a part of me was like, I gotta go get the pizza. But I had to like talk myself out of thinking that way because mm. I didn't want to do that. I see. Honestly, I kind of had the same thought. Um, I last, the day before we started, I had a dinner party and I made this like 
carrot cake. I put my whole heart and soul into this carrot cake. And like, you know, I did have like a bigger than normal slice because I was like, I'm not going to be able to eat this. And like, you know, obviously I send my head go guests home with stuff, but I'm like, take the whole entire cake that I spent my whole day baking. And they, they took it. They took it. They took it. <laughs> I was like, bye, cake. We'll gladly take it they, off your yes. hands. I'm, I'm glad they took the cake. It didn't go to waste. But I was like, I'm so sad that I don't get to eat more of this cake. Or like we had mashed potatoes. And I was like, I'm not going to be able to eat mashed potatoes for a whole month. Yeah. So, you know, I definitely did have some of that mindset. And, you know, what you were saying about never having gone on an intentional diet, I actually thought about that as well. And I was like, wow, I feel very like, I guess, stressed, stressed, but also like, you know, I know that's an experience that so, so, so mm. many people have. And I can't even imagine like the stress that that must be. And we talk a lot about, you know, diet culture and how that can actually lead to worse health outcomes, like mental health outcomes mm. and, you know, weight fluctuations. And just in this fraction of an experience of what other people have had, I totally see how that's yeah. true. What's interesting is like, I think overall, I am I like eating healthy. Like that is something that's important to me. So there are, I do, I think maybe make different choices than a lot of people often, but I've never actually felt restricted from like an external source. Hi everyone. So it's day five of paleo and I'm actually in the office in downtown Toronto right now. What I like to do during my breaks when I'm here is go for a little stroll in the path. Uh, for those who don't know, the path is essentially this giant underground pedestrian walkway on all underneath Toronto. Uh, so join me, I'm gonna take you on a little tour of all the foods that Robina can't eat. So on Friday, I was I, when I was downtown, I was going for a walk along the path and like normally like, there's so many food places, there's like pastry shops, like macaroons and like chocolates, like all, all of the things and I can walk past it. I don't even think about it. It's just like, oh, that looks pretty. Oh, mm -hmm. like that looks good. But I don't, like I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But like I found that this past Friday, it was like, upsetting me almost that like I couldn't have it even though if I could have it I might not I might not even really cared about it but it was weird honestly I feel that so much because you know I've been like spending time with friends and like you know even things that like I normally wouldn't even care to have I'm like oh they're having bread I'm like oh I want bread or like at work so guys I just came back from Blackberry Espresso and what I have here is uh, some kind of berry herbal tea. It smells delicious, but it is a little bit different from what I would typically get, like a London fog or some kind of like milk-based drink. And all my colleagues got, I think, some kind of latte. So I'm a little bit disappointed, even though this does smell delicious. So I am looking forward to it. At lunch one day, someone had a sandwich. Someone got shawarma, and I'm sitting there Just eating the like simplest thing. Right? Sweet potato. I'm like no. Yeah. And so it's interesting, the psychology of like, you know, food cravings and just like the thoughts mm -hmm. around food is very, very interesting. I don't think I had a very, any specific food cravings this past week, more so it was just like, oh my God, I, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. Now I want it. It was my nephew's birthday and my sister had a whole menu plan, none of which was paleo approved, of course. Uh, so I decided to bring over some stuffed peppers. You know, I figured that this type of dish, it can work as an appetizer or side dish for everyone else, but it can also serve as an entree for me. Uh, but look at all of these foods that I wasn't able to eat. And oh my goodness, look at this gorgeous, gorgeous mango cake. And what I had was this sad little bowl of blueberries. Just like you, I didn't really have specific cravings, but it was mostly just like when I was around other people who were eating certain things. I just wanted those yeah. things. I have my friend Sophie over for dinner and I'm so sad because this is what I'm having. My steak and vegetables. Oh, actually I can turn, can I turn the camera around? No, I can't. Okay, steak and vegetables. And this is what she's having. Mashed potatoes, quinoa, vegetables, and cake for dessert. Let's talk about food cravings though. I think it's a, a, a very prevailing thought that food cravings are a result of maybe a nutritional inadequacy or a deficiency where your body's like very in a strong way trying to communicate to you that you need some type of nutrient or some type of food. Uh, I have had, you know, clients tell me like, oh, you know, every time I have a meal, like I really want something sweet after, does that mean that I'm missing something in my main meal? Like, is it not a good enough meal? 
And what's interesting and maybe not super intuitive, but the research is kind of consistent in this area that they have more to do with social and psychological factors more so than physiological need. For example, when you're talking about the idea of like wanting something sweet after a meal, which I think is a very common experience. I've heard a lot of people mention that. That might be more a Pavlovian conditioning. And I think anyone that's taken a Psych 101 course probably knows what that is. But just a quick rundown, it's basically, you know, Pavlov was a researcher, he worked with dogs. Every time he would go to feed the dogs, he would realize that the dogs would be salivating. So at some point he he, he decided to do an experiment. Every time he would go to feed the dogs, he would also make a particular sound. So he kept doing that for a while. And then after a certain point, he would just make that sound and the dogs would immediately start salivating to this supposedly neutral stimulus. And that, you know, of course this was done forever ago and was in dogs, but this type of experiment has been replicated in humans countless times and turns out we're the same. Mm -hmm. Our brains are really quick to make associations between environmental cues and the pleasure of eating foods pretty, pretty quickly. So that might be what's happening with a lot of cravings where maybe there's external cues, maybe internal cues that are driving that desire to eat a certain type of food. And what's interesting is some of those cues can even be hunger itself. If when you feel hunger, you end up eating a certain type of food, that could be the trigger that causes you to kind of, I guess, start salivating or start craving things, I guess, if that makes sense. It could also be time of day, certain activities. There's all these little things that we do that could be potential triggers of food cravings that we don't really think about. For me, throughout this week, when I had food cravings, it was more just like a longing for like, I wish I wasn't having to eat sweet potato, but you know, in the mornings I normally have like toast with something mm -hmm. or I have oatmeal with something. And so just having to change my routine like that made me crave those foods that I'm so used to like bread and oats. It's just after seven. I woke up a little while ago, but I'm just eating breakfast now. And I honestly kind of forgot. <laughs> Um, so I didn't go grocery shopping yesterday because I'm not that organized. Um, so I'm going to use what I have that is paleo and I'm going to be making some sweet potatoes and some eggs for breakfast, which I'm really hungry. So I'm <laughs> a little disappointed that I have to wait so long. Yes, that's true. Bread. Bread was something mm -hmm. that I was craving quite a bit. I'm going to be making my lunch today. Typically what I would have right now is kind of an open face sandwich with bread. I'd put avocado on it. I put some chicken breast on it. And I would douse that thing in hot sauce and it is delicious. Um, I was kind of trying to find a way to basically replicate that um, because I love that meal. It's just so quick to put together, especially if you have kind of things the, like the chicken and everything meal prepped in advance. So I picked this up at Costco yesterday. So these are wraps that are, I mean, the main ingredients are eggs and cauliflower powder. I, I'd like to say that I'm excited to try this, but I'm looking at it. I don't know. Okay, so shall we dive right into this? Ooh, let's see, let's see. Yeah, and especially like walking past like bakeries and stuff, the smell of like baked goods, yeah. the pastry shops and stuff. <laughs> There's nothing better than that smell. Right, Luna, right? Yeah. yeah, she's 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 more of a paleo gal. She's been she's been on the true paleo for 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 her whole. Life. Speaking of our restricted week, though, mm. that's actually another big contributor to cravings. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's been quite a bit of research in this area. Typically, the subjects have been university students that are healthy, so we don't know if we can apply this to everyone, but they've done studies where they've told university students like, hey, like cut out chocolate or hey, cut out carb foods or hey, cut up, cut out salty foods for this period of time. Can you imagine doing that in university? Hey. Those are the things keeping you going. I know, but hey, if someone's like, here, I'll give you like 50 bucks. I'd be like, hey, absolutely, bring it on. And they ask them kind of how their food cravings go when they cut out these foods over a short period of time, typically anywhere from one day to two weeks. And what's interesting is that almost always and very consistently they find that cutting out these foods causes people to crave these foods even more which shocker shocker but they've also found that there are certain groups of people who may be more susceptible to this so if you're someone who craves let's say chocolate to begin with when you cut out chocolate you're gonna crave chocolate even more than people who aren't really huge chocolate cravers in the beginning which i guess kind of also makes 
common sense. But you know what? We tested the hypothesis and it was true. Also, you probably hear like, all the chairs squeaking. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what to do with that. I'll play my Kia. So then you would think like restricting on the long term, you probably have an increase in food cravings. And you know, you hear this a lot, especially in like the intuitive eating circles. It's like, oh, you know, if you're restricting, that's why you have cravings and that's why you're like binging or whatever. But it actually seems to be the opposite. When you look at some of the research that's out there, when people have like caloric restriction in the long term, and typically this takes the form of, you know, reducing carbohydrates, um, reducing processed foods, typically cravings go down. It's interesting to see that. And I actually think in my own experience, that is true for myself. I think that's true for me as well. I think maybe there's a combination of your palate just changing, your preferences changing, and maybe that Pavlovian conditioning getting a little weaker over time as well. Let's talk about the horrible part of the week. I think we just covered the subpar part of the week. Let's talk about the absolute <laughs> mind-blowingly horrible sh part of the week. Non-stop hunger. I was starving. I, I was starving the whole week. I was never not hungry. Like even after a meal, I was like, okay, I need more food. And like, the thing is, is like my stomach was definitely full because yeah. I'd be just eating more sweet potato, just eating more sweet potato. And I'm like, I feel like- I've heard this girl talk about sweet potato like 800 times this I'm week. I'm sweet potato. I like was kind of indifferent to it to begin with, but just eating my sweet potato oh. and my stomach's like please no more sweet potato but then immediately i'm hungry yeah and it's interesting because all these foods that we're eating are supposed to be like healthy diet foods because like they're so satiating it sounds like the way from talking to you about it it sounds like it was physically filling mm -hmm. but just not mentally sa satisfying i don't know because i still had this hunger pangs mm. i had the hunger pangs but my stomach was full and then like even if i was like oh my stomach's full an hour later my stomach was not full i think for me it was a mental satisfaction thing because same thing like i would eat like a giant bowl of fruit or something and it would be like so full like I, like you almost feel gross at the thought of eating more food but i'm still hungry like i still yeah. want to eat more yeah. and it was like a very uncomfortable feeling that never really went away okay so we're back not gonna lie that egg wrap situation was not filling whatsoever i think it was just so thin and so low in calories that i was like it, i didn't even like half an hour later i was like i need to eat again so i did have a bowl of fruit already and that kind of helped i think all the the fiber and like the hydration in there helped a little bit but honestly i'm still still very hungry so i'm having a little bit more fruit and i'm gonna have this as well these rx bars um it doesn't explicitly say that it's paleo approved or paleo friendly uh, but online, it seems like people do think that it's paleo friendly and even looking at the ingredients, I don't see why it wouldn't be considered paleo approved. Um, so I'm hoping the combination of this two is going to make me feel a little bit more satisfied. Cheers. I know you had some some mini breakthroughs. I had week. some mini breakthroughs. So like, I think it was the third day when I realized that I, I absolutely need to add more protein. So firstly, upping the portion size of the, like I was eating chicken and stuff for lunch and just increasing that portion size helped. I, I, I was like full for at least like a solid hour extra, which <laughs> made her, I was able to like focus on work a bit better and like just not, be a raging bee uh, honestly, for a little bit i've been i've been a raging bee all week it's all it's honestly it felt like i was in the depths of exam season again i felt like a completely different person yeah which is shock i honestly like i'm actually blown away because there are just a few it doesn't when i think about it intellectually i'm like did i change that much but like the few things like, I think not having bread somehow, like, really messed me up. Do you think it's, like, a psychological thing? Like, you're just thinking about not having bread and that's making you... I don't think I'm consciously thinking about it. Oh, okay. I've just been so... Sna I've been, like, the worst yeah. wife ever. Yeah. I, yeah. I've not been my best. Definitely not been my best. And, like, I know it, too. You know when you're, like, being horrible and... Oh, you... the words are just flying out of your mouth. And then you're, like, you're, like, I know I'm being horrible. And then... There's just nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. It's still, 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 still coming out. Still, still, yeah. Yeah. So, hope week two, the goal is maybe like my body will adjust more to this diet 
hopefully I can feel more full. Yeah. But you said adding more protein yes. helps. Adding more protein to the meals themselves. And then also instead of just eating fruit, adding, I started having two eggs with my fruit. Okay, so it's mid-afternoon on day four of paleo. And I mentioned before, you know, I've been trying really hard over the last couple of months to increase my protein intake. And, you know, before we started this paleo thing, I had been relying on like protein bars and protein shakes and stuff, none of which can fly on the paleo diet. So, you know, over the last, the first two days, I was quite hungry, I think just because my protein intake wasn't high enough. So yesterday with my fruit snack, I actually had two eggs as well. And that made such a huge difference. So I'm definitely going to keep that in mind for all my days moving forward. I uh, definitely got, I mean, I love eggs and I think the, the protein and fat in there really do help with keeping me satiated. So let me show you what my afternoon snack today looks like. That really, really helped. I love eggs too. So it made, I think it men mentally made me happy too, to ha look forward to that and have that as a snack. Uh, and yes, I think protein is key. And you know, like this isn't really a huge surprise because like, yeah, it's not just a me thing. It's not, it's like a, it's not a universal thing. And as a dietitian, we should probably already know that. So like, add protein to your meals to feel more full. And that's like pretty consistent across the literature is like, when they look at the three macronutrients, so these are the, the nutrients that give you energy. So it's protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Protein comes out on top as being the most filling. So basically they like give people a bunch of protein, carbohydrates, or fats, and then they like fill out this survey and tell us how full you felt. And protein makes people feel the most full. What else about that is it's not just like a psychological fullness. You also see changes in the hormones that make you feel full. So we made a video about like what exactly hunger is a while back. So if you remember some of those hormones like ghrelin and leptin and GLP-1, it changes those hormones to make you feel fuller. This is actually kind of like an acute effect. So it's basically right after the meal, you see this effect, but when they look over the long term, if you eat lots of high protein foods for a long period of time, typically you don't see that like your just natural resting levels of those hormones are, you know, more, like you're more satiated just at resting. No, it's just typically after those meals, which is so something that needs to be consistent. Yes. Right. Prioritizing protein in your meals and snacks. So that's going to be me this week, prioritizing protein in my meals and snacks because I'm starving. Yeah. I'm starving. Speaking of that, it's when you think about the next week, are there, or even the past week, what are your reflections in terms of how well you did your level of adherence? all of those things. Cause actually in this paleo world, there's actually different levels of paleo that you can do. There's like low level, mid level, top level, and then true paleo. Where do you think you fall? Honestly, I've been like pretty adherent to this diet. I feel like I've been pretty top level paleo. Um, I'm actually pretty impressed that you've you. been sticking with it pretty good. I also just kind of know myself. And I think like if I let it slide a little bit, mm. I'm going to let it slide too much. So I think these rules, I have to stick to the rules. Additionally, I've had some great external support in terms of really sticking to it. I did want to buy some paleo ketchup, but unfortunately that had salt in it. And I was reminded that added salt is not part of a paleo diet. So that's the thing. I would rate myself maybe at the mid level and it's mostly the salt thing. So I haven't been adding salt to the foods that I've been preparing myself, but I have been having some packaged foods like the C8 almond flour tortillas, um, mostly that and that does have salt in it so i think because of that i'm, I'm gonna put myself at the mid level okay. we're kind of challenging ourselves we decided that week four minus is, valentine's day oh we really i don't know it's up to you it's i i don't i've been told by my valentine date that i'm he's not gonna make me cheat on my paleo diet so i don't oh, know so what do you so wait so you are gonna okay what I was going to say is week four, we're going to try to do seven days of strict, true paleo. But you're right. Valentine's Day falls yeah. that week. So do you want, do you want an exception of one meal? Because like, it is still 85, 15 still, I think. No, the no. true paleo is 100%. Okay, never mind. Okay. Well, the top paleo. I feel like I could do the top paleo that week. I just know that like Valentine's Day is like a thing for you. Well, it's a thing for me too, but I've been told, I literally told my... I guess I could delay... 14th, that's a Tuesday, so you yeah. just delay it. Until the Sunday? No, mine. We have to go through, get through all of Sunday. I was going to go to when we film. I was going to filming. <laughs> okay, so you're going to end it a day early, or like half a day early. Mm -hmm. Okay, well then I get one meal. Too, okay, there you I go. 
it's sorted. So that's what we're working our way up to. I think, uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to slowly kind of work my way up to that, but I'm gonna give myself another week of mid-level, you know? Yeah, I've been eating olives because I love olives so much, so. That's know. why you're not putting yourself what, at the true. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, so all yeah, right. You ready to go get some paleo brunch? Woo, paleo brunch. finished one week of being paleo and we're celebrating with a little paleo brunchy lunch. <laughs> yeah, so we're at Impact Kitchen in Toronto and I have a hero bowl and this is more of a paleo flex meal because there's for sure added salt. And I got the paleo waffles which I, uh, to be full disclosure, used to work at this restaurant and the paleo waffles actually slap. But again, paleo flex. We have definitely made this here, but here's some salt in here. But I'm very excited for this. I'm excited. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. And follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Thanks for watching. Bye.